Well, good afternoon um, and welcome. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be together. Uh, uh, you know, this is the second year of this program uh, and the first really in person and hybrid. So I'm feeling uh, particularly thrilled. I'm Merit Jano, former dean of SIPA and a professor at SIPA and the law school. Uh, and it's just marvelous uh, to be together with all of you t today. Um, and I'm uh, very grateful and admiring of uh, 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 Mutar Kent for getting us started down this pathway and so pleased you're uh, with us, uh, Mutar, and uh, Jean-Marie Gaino for uh, really directing this program and putting this outstanding uh, uh, week uh, together. Um, I think we'll be joined by one other. The only disadvantage of this seat is that I can't look behind and see the other speakers as readily as I can all of you. So apologies if I find myself shifting uh, back and forth. You know, the basic idea of the Kent program from the beginning um, was that there's hardly an area of um, conflict conflict resolution, uh, peace building, responding to humanitarian crises, or even just building uh, resilient societies that doesn't require cooperation between governments, corporations, and NGOs. Um, and each operating in their relative sphere of influence and competence, and in today's world where possible together uh, in support of, uh, of shared objectives. And today we have a chance to hear from really extraordinary individuals who can bring these perspectives uh, to bear. So my hope is that each will speak for a few minutes and then we'll have a chance for interaction. And I really invite each to speak to regions they know best, initiatives they have inaugurated or been part of, lessons and observations from your own lives and experiences uh, in conflict, in coalition building for growth, prosperity, and peace. And I think that rich tapestry will offer a, uh, the basis for this very expert group of Kent participants, fellows, um, to engage with our expert panel. Now, you have their bios, so I will be brief, but let me start by uh, uh, Remy Ryu, who's right here with me. I'm very happy about that who's been CEO of France's Development Agency since 2016, AFD, and chairman of the International Development Finance Club since 2017. He is an expert in economics and international finance, and he has really devoted a lot of his career on development issues in Africa. So I know you bring deep uh, uh, expertise from that region. And he served as chief of staff of the French economy and was appointed deputy secretary general of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Development and coordinated the finance agenda for COP21, which was an extraordinary outcome and complex negotiation. We also have uh, with us virtually Amira Haq, who is a, a thank you very much for being with us. Um, She's a Bangladeshi uh, official who has served as the UN Under Secretary General for the Department of Field Support. She's been the highest ranking Bangladesh official at the UN from 2012 to 2014. And uh, Under Secretary Ban Ki-moon appointed her as co-chair of the High Level <coughs> Independent Panel on Peace Operations. She's also served as the Special Representative for Timor-Leste and head of the UN Integrated Mission in East Timor. But let me also note that she has served on NGO boards. I know she is on the board of Brock and other organizations. So thank you very much for being with us. Of course, I've also mentioned um, our own Mutar Kent. Um, after uh, nearly 40 years uh, serving uh, the world's largest beverage company, um, he rose from being a, a salesman to CEO of, of that company it was an extraordinary leader. He's also been incredibly civic-minded and engaged with so many organizations 
and is a fellow of the Foreign Policy Association, Chairman Emeritus of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, on the board of many organizations, including the American Turkish Society, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and was an eminent persons group for ASEAN by uh, President Barack Obama. And with us, uh, he has been really a partner in building the Kent program. So thank you, Mutar, for your involvement, your wisdom, and your uh, participation today. Um, I think also we have with us Hamdi Ulukaya. I welcome uh, Hamdi. So great to see you again. You know, he's been obviously a pioneer in the natural food movement, founder of Chobani, which is one of the fastest growing uh, food companies in the last decade. He grew up in a small town in Turkey and he launched Chobani in 2007 with the whole vision of making food more accessible. And it became the number one Greek yogurt brand in the US with more than a billion dollars in annual sales. He also created uh, clearly uh, uh, a creature of his own imagination and passion, the Tent Partnership for Refugees, uh, which is an organization made up of more than 200 other member organizations, I congratulate, which is really focused on improving the lives of refugees around the world, and we hope to hear more about that in our discussions uh, today. And also with us in person, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Matthew Devlin, who leads international relations at Uber, which focuses on all the public policy aspects of the company's expansion and operations outside the United States. Prior to joining Uber, he was uh, working both uh, in the private sector and public sector reform on Latin America, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Asia. He has a degree from our partner, Friends School, Harvard Kennedy School, uh, and a law degree from Yale. So thank you, Matthew, for being and here. And I'm so. adding a bravery medal for allowing myself to be introduced after this panel. So <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. Delighted to have you. May I invite Remy to lead us off, please? Uh, hello, everybody. It's a great uh, honor and pleasure to be, um, to be here. Uh, uh, actually, um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best place to start the discussion, but if I'm right, your discussion has already started uh, since um, this morning. Or, um, because coming, uh, coming into this, um, uh, this panel, I was, uh, I was wondering why. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not an academic, of course. Um, I'm no longer uh, a diplomat, thank you. It's a session for, for diplomats. Um, so I'm not into a conflict, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, and and uh, maybe a specificity of uh, the organization of France is um, I'm not into humanitarian. Uh, so in many countries, in I don't know, in Sweden, in the US, or elsewhere, you have institutions that are doing uh, both uh, humanitarian and development. This is not the case uh, in France. And, I've, and, I, and I think that's an interesting uh, setting uh, for our discussion, meaning uh, uh, we are um, institutions, at least AFD uh, is an institution that is obsessed with, uh, uh, whose mandate is development, meaning we are, we are obsessed with uh, long-term uh, issues. Uh, and we are obsessed with uh, sustainability, I mean, uh, our inter interventions have to stay. They have to, they have to change the, the structures uh, of the territories, uh, the societies we are, uh, we are intervening. So somehow, uh, development is, uh, is the opposite of uh, humanitarian. I mean, it's, it's long-term compared to short-term. Uh, it's relying on uh, always uh, uh, on local uh, counterparts. I mean. AFD is never uh, operating uh, or financing directly a project. We are always uh, going through a local counterpart, which, which of course, um, in very, very, very troubled settings, you cannot find. Uh, um, so maybe I'm, I'm the least um, um, 
possible uh, intervenant for, for that. And I'm visiting New York uh, actually with uh, a group of uh, uh, CEOs of public development banks that I, I left for, for a moment to meet with you. So we have the CEO of uh, the Development Bank of Rwanda, the CEO of the Development Bank of Indonesia, PTSMI, and uh, the CEO of uh, the Development Bank of the State of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, and we're here to discuss with uh, uh, the IMF, the World Bank tomorrow, the UN, of course, this year, the, how, how do we finance uh, SDGs? So the, I would say the, the big thing, uh, the fight against climate change, the, uh, the just uh, transition uh, frameworks, uh, and the group I'm, I'm representing somehow, meaning uh, all public financial institutions, public development banks, uh, 550 in the world, amounts to uh, $2.7 trillion a year. So this is something that is uh, really at scale uh, with, uh, uh, with this agenda uh, 2030 uh, ESDGs. But, of course, and, and, and probably that's the reason why uh, Jean-Marie uh, <laughs> and you, Merit, uh, you asked me to, to come and say a few words. Uh, I do not forget that in the, in the 2015 uh, mandate message, uh, there was the, the leave no one behind uh, dimension. So somehow the mandate we received then is to do both. Uh, it's both to finance uh, common goods, uh, global public goods, uh, uh, but also uh, to find a way uh, to leave no territories, to leave no communities uh, uh, and, uh, behind. And, and probably this, uh, what uh, was um, set in the, in the, the SDG agenda uh, was extremely uh, innovative at that time. And probably we're only beginning to understand what, what it means to do, to do both. Uh, the, the situation we're living right now, of course, and, 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 and I think Jean-Marie uh, explained it very clearly in his, uh, his recent book, Le, Le Premier 21e Siècle, uh, I think it's very different from what we thought uh, 15 years ago. Um, I, I remember the book of Paul Collier, The Bottom Billion, uh, the 2011 uh, World Development Report on fragile situations. I mean, somehow this was, uh, this, there was a billion of people we had to, to support. Uh, uh, and if we had uh, the specific tools, the best way to intervene, I mean, they will come back uh, with us and then it will be fine. Uh, uh, and, and probably we are way beyond a billion right now. And then the, f the extension of uh, uh, the fragilities uh, because of climate, uh, because of uh, inequalities, because it's is going way, way beyond uh, maybe the, the, the situations you are discussing uh, today. Uh, and probably the, these fractures, these lines uh, of divide, uh, uh, they, are, they are in each and every society, including, uh, including ours. Uh, in France, if I'm right, there was an election yesterday. Um, um, and so we have to invent or adapt or transform uh, our institutions to be, to be able to explore these, uh, uh, these, um, these linkages and, 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 and have various instruments converge uh, in, a, in, a, in, a new, uh, in, a, in a new way. Um, so this is what we are trying to do. Um, uh, it's no longer a co continuum of interventions, as you know it. So I'm, I'm talking about contiguum. I mean, uh, uh, of course, we need to have uh, all the capacities, uh, defense, diplomacy, humanitarian, and development uh, at the same time, uh, and each and every step of a, of a crisis, uh, which was not probably what we had in mind uh, Previously, meaning uh, you need development banks, development agency uh, to um, change the way they operate uh, in order to, uh, yes, to be alongside uh, uh, other professionals trying to, to find a solution. And then, of course, find the, the amount of each uh, component uh, you need uh, for, um, 
conflict resolution or to uh, or to prevent further uh, further conflict. So um, I will not go into the details of what uh, AFD is doing because it's a question mark for for all of us uh, in my in my in my mind. Um, but of course, we had to. Um, to allocate part of the resources for fragile setting. We had to uh, um, to speed up, uh, because when you when you have a counterpart, and the counterpart is very weak, of course it takes a lot of time uh, to strengthen, bring capacities, uh, um, and um, cooperate. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it's more of uh, doing our development work uh, uh, in a, in a new way and being able to uh, to um, to support and to accompany uh, SDGs uh, um, everywhere. So ju just to share that with you, I have no clear answer as you as you see, but I have clear questions. And this is certainly a tension and, a, and, a, and an evolution that is happening. Uh, um, I would say both on the side of donors, classic donors doing the humanitarian as well as, I mean, the, the development part that you are doing with grants, which is a very small one, actually. I mean, these type of institutions, um, they know now that they have to mobilize the private sector. They know that they have to find a way to invest in uh, water and sanitation and uh, infrastructure. So they, they are developing, for instance, guarantee mechanisms or things like that, which is very unusual. And on the other side, I mean, the world of uh, public banks, public development banks, like multilateral or, or, or national, uh, we know that we, have, we, can, we cannot uh, let these frailties uh, develop. So we, we need to find ways to operate. So the good news is that uh, we were living somehow, um, I mean, we were somehow saying we were doing the same thing, but uh, we were very, very different. See USAID, for instance, USAID, uh, if I'm right, is uh, passing only 6% of its resources through uh, local counterparts. And AFD, it's 94%. So it's really something completely different. But uh, um, USAID is willing to increase uh, the share uh, up to 20, 25%, if I'm right. And we also understood that, well, when you are in, a, in the Sahel, sometimes you, you have no counterpart. And so you, you need to provide a impact. And so you need to, to do it by yourself somehow, temporarily, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so I see, uh, because of SDGs, and again, this is the, our framework, I see a sort of convergence uh, between uh, institutions uh, uh, and the possibility maybe to 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 avoid uh, these uh, these never ending uh, uh, drama uh, certain territories are living that that was what the bottom billion was about a few years ago thank you thank you very much you know i jumped in uh, uh, to get us started <coughs> because we're all together, but I denied Jean-Marie some introductory <coughs> remarks if you had wanted to make any, because uh, you have been conceptualizing this panel more broadly, and let me just invite you if you wish to. Oh, no, j just, a, just a couple of words. I mean, I, I think it was important to have a voice from a public major public institution of development like the uh, AFD for the reasons that uh, Rémi Rieu stated, because they are it shows the wide range of, uh, of options that exist, uh, whether you directly engage or whether you engage through local partners. And I was interested in what you said at the end on uh, the relationship with uh, business and corporations, because on the one hand, you, you mentioned that in a way you are at scale when one, compare, when one puts together all I mean, the huge amounts of money that exist with uh, banks that can fund uh, uh, what, you, what you're doing, but on the other hand, even that is not quite at scale without the active participation of corporation and business. And, uh, and in that panel, I, I'm interested in also in, uh, in getting from, from all the panelists uh, this where, not where public action ends, but 
how public action interfaces yes. with the action of other actors, uh, yes. whether it's business actors, and business actors, they can be on the humanitarian side as well on the, as the development side, through corporate governance, through a variety of things. Uh, how is that in interaction working? And hearing from you, from uh, business actors like uh, Matthew or MD, and from uh, uh, people like uh, Amira Haq, who, uh, who knows from within uh, the role of uh, civil society, as well as from the UN perspective. I think that's what we have to get at, is really the, the links between those, uh, those various players who, who don't easily talk to each other. I mean, you, you were mentioning, like me, as we were entering the room, that in a way you were the development guy in the middle of uh, people are more diplomats than development people. So, uh, if I mean, uh, you, you've already spoken. But if, you, <laughs> if you if you had uh, one word to add, uh, when you have to reach out to business, uh, how do you do it? And uh, can you give us a, one uh, maybe concrete example uh, of that? Yeah. Oh, it can last a bit of time. Just to remind you, one first thing is a, 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 a public development bank by itself is a way to mobilize private finance. I mean, simply because we are issuing bonds on the market. Uh, and so, and so in private investors can use these instruments to go in very fragile settings only by buying their papers. I mean, uh, so we, we, this is the first way, because uh, sometimes it's, it's, a <coughs> bit, it's a bit naive to imagine that uh, we, will, uh, we will succeed in having uh, large corporations coming into at the heart of Sahel. I mean, wh how? Why? Uh, no, it will not happen. But we are at the heart of Sahel, and we are financed uh, through the market. So that, uh, certainly that's one way that is often uh, um, uh, forgotten uh, to, mobilize, uh, to mobilize private finance by increasing the balance sheet of uh, public banks uh, themselves. Um, then there are a lot of uh, experiences happening. Uh, small local business. Too. Small local business. Um, um, and um, again, uh, uh, very important to, uh, to invest, have uh, l local uh, MSMEs uh, emerging. So the solution will not come from FDI. Uh, of course, very helpful if we have foreign investors coming. But as you know, it, a foreign investor will never come. We will be listened to, <laughs> to colleagues only if it has uh, an entry point in the, in the country, if, if there's someone, uh, uh, an SME that is able to explain the market. Uh, that is, uh, be, even before talking about uh, um, the business climate of the country, uh, taxation, or the, stab the stability, uh, the political stability or not. Uh, a firm just need a counterpart in the country. Uh, and if there's none, uh, I mean, we have a problem and there's no way to attract uh, private investors. So for first, having home, home ground, having uh, uh, the, the DFIs, I mean, this particular uh, segment of the public development banks that are devoted uh, to financing the private sector is absolutely key uh, to have the whole, uh, the whole system uh, deployed. Thank you very much. Let me uh, now go to our uh, distinguished guests who are with us virtually, and perhaps I'll invite Hamdi uh, to speak, uh, uh, because you have been working both individually but also building coalitions of businesses around a shared purpose. Share with us what has motivated this and how you think it's, how is it, how is it working, and is there a public-private aspect to it? I'm so honored to be here with you, and especially I'm so honored that um, you know the 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 seminar is about. It starts with Kent, um, someone I respect greatly on business. Um, uh, call him, um, you know, Muhtarabi. Um, and if his name is going to be attached to any topic, it would be this uh, conflict resolution. Um, you know, I don't come from a business background. I come from a farming background in the eastern part of Turkey not having so much, you know, positivity against it, uh, but being in it now and having a perspective when I think he lived and operated the business 
with mind of how to deal with um, governments uh, or policymakers and have in mind that business have uh, power and that power comes with responsibility and some of that power can make life better for others and using the uh, business's capability in partnering with the NGO world uh, is also part of the business. So this world is more and more is unseparable and we no longer live in our isolations and we cannot sh shout out or throw things to each other from distance. So there has to be a finding a way to work in together. So that's my point, um, you know, starting point. And I want you all and, and, and Mukhtar Abid to invite me here. Um, we are different in the world of business, right? We, we kind of kind of look at the, the policymakers and, and I think the government represents more like a bureaucratic place. And we often complain about a large NGO world, also uh, a bureaucratic, wasting a lot of time and wasting a lot of other things, uh, resources at the same time. And then as business get larger, somehow also sometimes gets closer to the things that we complain about, you know, more bureaucratic and, um, and decisions don't come through uh, really fast. And I heard being mentioned, there is a third power in all in this dimension, which is the consumer and necessity of the social dynamics and, 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 and issues and problems that we, we went through and expectations of the, you know, the, especially the young, but the, uh, the societies from all those three dimensions, especially business and, and, and government. This has been said in the last decade, but I don't think has ever been so clear as of today that public private partnership is essential. It's a must. If we are going to make any changes or differences on this, on the issues that we are facing as humanity globally. And I, I've heard, you know, climate change. There is no solution if we don't, you know, if we don't get together and do this partnership. And it's not just in a verbal way, but has to be find a way to work together. Um, you're talking about refugees, you know, I'll, I'll give a little bit of examples on the refugees. There is no solution to bring this most alarming humanitarian crisis that we're facing in the world today if there is no private-public partnership. That means government, NGOs, and, 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 and businesses in a very, very meaningful way, way. So that means that if one finds the other one is boring, we have to find a way to make sure that we are not bored in these meetings and we have uh, you know, long lasting relationship. And I'm talking very simplicity on a human level. Um, I, I have seen signs, i be honest with you. I have seen signs working with some government agencies and working with large UN agencies when it comes to topic refugees in the last three, four, five years. You know, when we started TENT, um, the humanitarian side of refugees, which is the saving uh, people's life and bringing uh, shelter above their head and yet, refugees stays in refugee camps or whatever the city that they, they settled uh, average 19 years. But there's, there's, a, there's other angles of this, which is the employment, um, education, health, um, or human potential being stuck and not moving any forward. So, and you know, global NGOs like the UN foundations can do only so much, government, can only do so much. But when you bring the business side of things and say, hey, there's a win-win-win here that if we all work together, um, hey, um, NGO, you do all the uh, you know, safety, education, whatever your specialty is, uh, shelter. Uh, government, can you do the uh, you know, uh, adjustments on working permits or you know, uh, other things that come related to it? and the business uh, prepared to hire and train and, 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 and make it part of the society. And we have examples over and over from uh, Colombia to Netherlands, to Brazil, to US, to Canada, to, to, to Western Europe. 
uh, this model works, but it, it really requires uh, getting together. And what is, what is good for NGO, what is good for the government is good for the business. That means it's good for the consumer. That means it's good for the uh, extended society. If some conflict is good for business, I don't know if I want to call that a business. I mean, that means that you're either making guns or you're making something that is good for the business when there's a conflict. If the suffering of humanity is good for the business, that means it's a, you know, it's a business that is not generally, I see it as business. But for the most part, what business likes is the conflict to be resolved, humanity to move forward, and people to be optimistic about the future. And if the government's job is, or the policymaker's job is the same, which is to move uh, their, their country or, or the people who live in that country or in that region to move forward. And if you look at the NGOs, you know, of course the purest uh, of all is to help humanity move forward or, or the planet to be res reserved or move forward. So it is good for all partners to come together to make this happen. So then the environment is good for the society. I think the number one is how do we talk, how do we get to know each other, how do we talk to each other, how do we find a common goal within each other, and how we, um, you know, how we make this work. I find from my own experience, and I, I live with it there, um, from my own experience, there is a bigger reception on the policymakers on the government side to the businesses more than ever before. And I can speak on, you know, here in the US or the rest of the world that I have been to. There is a power of, of businesses and CEOs more than ever before being represented with the uh, employees and the workers and the consumers and the brand of power if it act in the right direction, meaning consciously social uh, in, in, and, and attent authentic. And I think it's been expect, accepted that when it comes to getting things done, the way that is done in the business is the most probably faster and most economic way to get it done. So there is a benefit from all dimensions that getting together. I have never seen the reception as much as I have seen, as I said before. But we still have question marks because the policymakers are always changes from election to election. The ideas can change. The opinion on social conflict can change. One can be for it. One can be against it. And how do your businesses and NGOs can can interact with the policymakers on this dimension? So there is this there is this uncertainty. Uh, but yet, really, if, if the case is done in a convincing way, in, for example, you ask the refugees, when we go to the policymakers, we make economic um, studies, scientific studies, and say supporting refugees to be part of workforce in your country, in your community, in the long run, four years and five years is the best thing you can do for your economy. And here's the proof, and here's the studies has been done. And if we can make that kind of arguments, it's really, you know, that that risk, I shouldn't say is eliminated completely, but it is it is reduced. But if you're talking about health in, in Africa, like Mukhtar and Coca-Cola get involved all these years, uh, or girls education, this is something that is really never changes. It's 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 always there. It's it's just finding a way to coming together and working together. And I, I really do believe the only way that we're going to find any solutions to the big conflicts and, and problems that we are facing is going to come on this topic that you're just talking about. It's as crucial, as important as anything else. And if we do that, really, there is no problem that we cannot solve, including uh, uh, you know, climate, including climate. Today, I'll just give you one simple example of 220 companies on 10 partnership for refugees and, and committing to hire and train and support refugees wherever they are with 
uh, collaboration and relationship with the government and NGOs in each uh, territory that you operate. And that allowed these hundreds of thousands of refugees to have a job that otherwise they wouldn't be. It's a, it's a simple, you know, small example of how things are. I would love to believe that if we have put these conflict resolutions in a highest place, and if I would love to believe that if businesses and CEOs get involved, we probably could have saved a lot of refugee making conflicts that in the world that is today. We probably could have stopped uh, certain conflicts already that is causing enormous amount of refugees in, you know, globally, including Syria, maybe Russia, and maybe, maybe Venezuela. So I think the, the world leaders needs to bring more and more business leaders uh, into, into these type of discussions and, and finding solutions. And we need to, of course, work deeper with, with the NGO community. Thank you very, very much. I think you've spoken to exactly the um, ambition uh, that we have here for the Kent program, which is to bring these uh, diverse um, but powerful interests together uh, in support of uh, conflict resolution where that proves possible, building resilient societies where that proves possible. Um, and as you're saying, uh, you know, how to create those conditions uh, for continuity and for collaboration and finding those opportunities. That is, uh, I think, what we're, we are exploring and you've offered some wonderful uh, comments that help contextualize it. Let me now invite uh, Amira Haq to offer. You've heard now these comments and you've been working in some real conflict zones. And so as you hear this conversation, could you share with us how your reactions and your thoughts about what role for bringing different constituencies together in some of the most difficult settings that you've seen and with the very powerful institutions that you've been part of? Thank you. Merit and uh, hello, Jean-Marie and the rest of the panel members. Um, it's um, wonderful to uh, join you today on this very important topic. Uh, I must say before I start, um, uh, Hamdi uh, Ulukai, I won't remember, but a few years ago, I was on a panel with you at the UN Foundation with uh, Princess Rania of Jordan was also there. And I heard at that time you talking about employing in Chobani the refugees and the program. And I have used that example over and over and over again in terms of saying, you know, it can be done. And here's, uh, you know, proof that, uh, you know, this, this kind of partnership is, is, is there. So uh, let me just, I'll, yes, uh, Merit, I will talk from both the perspective, UN perspective and the um, NGO perspective. And from the UN perspective, uh, you know, Jean-Marie will know, and I happen to be right now in a seminar in, in Stockholm with, with UN colleagues. And because we are addressing a group of, uh, you know, diplomats who are in the audience, I think they will know what I'm talking about. But when we have a issue of uh, a peacekeeping mission being started by the UN, it is the Security Council that makes a decision in terms of saying, you know, we need the UN to go in and the Security Council gives the mandate um, for the mission in terms of what they want done in a particular conflict um, ridden country. And, um, you know, we've talked about the mandates that these missions get is uh, there's an expression that they are called Christmas tree mandates because each uh, member state sort of adds to the mandate their particular interest. And so these mandates become very unwieldy uh, in terms of the vast array of tasks and objectives that the Security Council sets for it. But one thing that doesn't, and I think still doesn't come about strongly in these mandates is the peace building part of it. So there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, the political settlements and the stabilization and the, you know, the human rights issues and uh, everything else, but the peace building doesn't get 
you know, it's it, it's uh, um, I would I would say the emphasis, the rightful emphasis um, that that it it should. And in uh, and the other part of that is that whilst the Security Council established the mandate and the member states of the UN are assessed, in other words, they have to pay the money in order to achieve that uh, mandate. The peace building work, which is the development work and the early recovery work and the humanitarian work, comes from a different part of member states' budgets, which are called voluntary contributions. And the reason that I take time to explain this is that I think, uh, you know, Hamdi is absolutely right that, you know, the multilateralism, I mean, I think the, 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 uh, as, as, as a concept is, you know, has, you know, there's tremendous sort of uh, onslaught, uh, you know, in terms of where multilateralism will, will end up. But also we know that in many capitals, the aid budget is shrinking. And the confluence of those two, you know, with this uh, kind of attack on multilateralism and aid budgets shrinking forces everyone to think about, well, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, you know, it can't all stop. And this is where partnerships is just absolutely critical. And I think partnerships with, the, you know, as you said, uh, businesses and other partners, absolutely critical. And uh, that if we look closer into what is most effective, and I have served for 40 years in the United Nations, and now, you know, after I retired, I came on the board of a number of NGOs, but one very large NGO, which is in Bangladesh called BRAC. And when I see the, the flexibility and the agility and the, uh, you know, the, the response times of NGOs, as opposed to, uh, you know, the larger, you know, uh, sort of more bureaucratic, whether they're uh, you know, bilateral aid or, or the UN, it makes a lot of sense to me to have NGO partners who can implement things very quickly um, on, the, on the ground. Uh, we have, for example, in, uh, in Bangladesh, as you all know, and I, uh, you know, there was um, a huge, uh, the Bangladesh government agreed to accept a million refugees, Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. I mean, that was a huge challenge. One million people crossing the border to come across. UNHCR is the agency, is the refugee agency. But UNHCR worked through BRAC to a large extent. And BRAC was actually the partner that was uh, reaching about 700,000 um, uh, of the refugees who had come across from Myanmar. And why? Because they could... Uh, deploy very quickly. There was no language barrier because you, you know, were able to mobilize large numbers of national staff. And also with an NGO, there are no bureaucratic uh, delays as we have in, in, in public, uh, you know, in the public um, sector agencies. So, you know, I think the, we have to wake up to this kind of uh, call and we have to, you know, become realistic uh, that, you know, we can't wait. As a result of COVID, for example, uh, you know, we've got what this, um, what we call the new poor, that uh, those who were once living in, in thriving uh, households uh, are now in this new poor status of uh, in a survival mode. And how do we reach out? These are, you know, people who are qualified uh, most of them, you know, maybe teachers or mid-level, you know, uh, bureaucrats, but suddenly they find themselves in a survival mode. So I think the partnerships and particularly I'm so, you know, so pleased always to hear when businesses, uh, you know, and, and, and the kind of uh, point that, um, that Hamdi has made that, you know, we need that kind of, uh, of partnership. And, um, you know, I have seen where businesses take an interest in a particular locality or a region, and you see that development take place in that region because 
you know, either the farmers, if they're, if they're you know, uh, if they've give, been given micro credit, um, you know, and have bought cows, they've got a, you know, a dairy uh, place where they can sell the milk to. And, you know, it, it, it sort of promotes uh, and they're able to send their children to, to school and education and everything else. So that kind of partnership, I think, is absolutely, um, absolutely um, critical. And the other factor, I think, with working with NGOs, which I also um, sort of, you know, as I say, you know, it, it, it was kind of um, uh, um, something that I felt that we didn't pay that much attention to, um, you know, in, 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 in my um, career in, in, in development was that very often those of us who are in, in uh, you know, sort of public agencies, and even if I, I, I may dare, so, dare say certain governments, we tend to work with sort of more what we call elites in the capitals or big urban centers, or maybe those who are living, you know, sort of along the, the main roads. But, you know, to go deep into, uh, you know, the deep field of, of uh, countries and regions and villages and, you know, where even roads don't exist and to try and reach those who are what we call absolutely the ultra poor. Uh, and again, there, I think there are huge partnerships now with, you know, technology, uh, you know, the ability, I mean, this uh, organization that, that I'm on the board of BRAC, uh, you know, they are reaching out through mobile telephones, through, uh, you know, the um, cash transfers, all kinds of things which can bring development through the private sector and take it right to the hinterlands where poverty matters and, uh, you know, where people really need to be lifted up and are in that category of absolutely the ultra poor. And that has a preventive element too, to relate it to conflict, you know, exactly the point that Hamdi make that some, you know, we needn't have to see these refugee situations, but we needn't also have to see conflicts beginning to start because people feel neglected or marginalized because they are not in the field of vision of those who are making policies. And so I think this is a very powerful, uh, you know, um, partnership that just has to be emphasized. And one other point that I would like to make is that, you know, there are people with, with ideas all over the world, but there is very little that's done in the realm of venture capital for social entrepreneurship. And um, so if someone has a great business idea, they can sell it. But if someone has also an idea where they say that, you know, uh, this is going to promote development, uh, you know, they don't normally get that, um, you know, the, the financing for that. And I think that kind of incubation, allowing ideas to incubate uh, through these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, venture capital for social entrepreneurship is also a very good step that, uh, you know, businesses um, can make and promote, I think, the, you know, the overall achievement, whether it's conflict resolution or, you know, just preventing conflict by emphasizing development and, you know, bringing the entire society along uh, with on, on, on a development trajectory. So let me leave it at that uh, merit and... Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. You've brought a great deal to this conversation. You know, I'm struck that uh, Remy started us off talking about the SDGs being your guiding light and working through uh, third parties. And, and Hamdi has told us about the critical collaboration between public, private, and NGOs and the ways in which this can have a powerful impact with refugees and uh, talked about how important this is. And you've brought us, Amira, far further about how um, really, uh, you know, peace building, uh, you know, kind of re requires new collaborations. And you're seeing some that you spoke to, uh, uh, which I too have seen in, in uh, companies bringing technologies and others. But really, there's no escaping that 
and uh, how important it is to reach, uh, you know, the far corners of the earth when the needs are the greatest. And you gave us many specific examples. You know, Mutar, you started us down this path. And I'd like to invite you to, from your life experiences and listening to this conversation, do you think we're, we're fashioning solutions going forward? Let me invite you to share your thoughts. Thanks, uh, Merit. And um, it, thank you also for agreeing to moderate this uh, session. Um, and um, I wanna thank um, all the distinguished panelists uh, um, Remy Rio and, and, uh, and uh, Amira Haq and Hamdi, of course, my good friend Hamdi and Matthew uh, Devlin. Um, and also, of course, my gratitude goes to Jean-Marie Gueno for uh, setting up a wonderful, a very rich um, week. Um, the um, idea, you know, when I first um, went to uh, Lee Bollinger and yourself, Merit, the idea came uh, from my uh, very deep belief uh, on what Hamdi talked about, which is, and I, uh, you've heard me before um, talk about um, the golden triangle, uh, the golden triangle of business, government, and civil society coming together to um, provide solutions, meaningful and sustainable solutions to the societal problems that faces the world, our world. What are those? Of course, climate change, poverty, famine, um, global trade, water, energy, education, uh, in, investment or lack of their, their investment. Um, the fourth industrial revolution uh, slash technology, inequality, both inside countries as well as outside countries. All these societal problems, issues, um, I had, I've always had, have had in my 45 years in business, a the very deep belief um, that these issues can only be solved with the uh, inherent collaboration of government, business, and civil society coming together to provide solutions. And so that's the, the essence of this program. And Add to that, you know, I, I will, we were educating through the, the incredible um, uh, faculty that uh, we're putting together. And, and in this case, again, my thanks to Jean-Marie for putting together this great faculty of government, business, and civil society leadership to share their own examples, their, their own experiences in how they have, you know, seen government, business, and civil society come together to solve conflict with diplomats and with civil servants around the world. And, you know, they are the future and they hopefully will get something out of the, uh, this week and, and the, this discussion. And we can, we will, of course, broadcast it later and, 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 and make sure that it gets to more people's hands and, and, and eyes and ears and, and that way we can make a difference in solving some of these societal issues and conflicts. Um, it, and I came from a, a, a belief that uh, these um, um, issues, um, I've been instrumental uh, in my business life in you know, putting together these kind of coalitions to solve some some um, provide some solutions. And I can give you two very concrete examples how that was done. One was uh, setting up a goal to uh, create 5 million women entrepreneurs around the world back in, two, um, and, um, in 2000. Uh, I gave uh, that goal a 10 year bandwidth um, um, in, in 2000, uh, put that goal together in 2010 for 2020. Um, that uh, we would create 5 million women entrepreneurs uh, outside of the four walls of the Coca-Cola company. Um, it was the biggest program of its kind undertaken by a commercial organization. And we went to each country, identified an NGO partner in each country. We went to the IFC and said, 
um, you know, let's do two agreements, $100 million each of microcredit. We put together with the NGOs in each country a training program, and the NGOs identified the woman leader, uh, woman uh, entrepreneurial candidates. Um, we put, uh, we trained the, uh, the woman uh, um, uh, um, entrepreneurial candidates in um, uh, um, distribution, logistics, retailing, um, basic accounting. These four uh, modules, simple. They got, when they graduated, um, uh, we linked them up to microcredit and off they went. The purpose, and, and, and when I got up at the annual general meeting, people would ask me the question, well, why, um, you know, what benefit do I get as a shareholder out of these 5 million women entrepreneurs? And I would say, it's a very simple algebra. The algebra is the following. Uh, Coca-Cola has 25 million um, retail customers around the world, restaurants, supermarkets, mom and pop stores, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of the 5 million women entrepreneurs, two and a half million became new retailers. They of course sell every other pro many other products. They just, they don't only sell Coca-Cola, but they never forget who put them into business. And that loyalty adds up to a, a very big benefit for you as a shareholder. And that's the algebra. Everybody has to win out of the, of the algebra. You can't, if there is no sustainable financial benefit to a corporation, they cannot continue doing what they're doing on a, a sustainable basis. It's got to be a, as Hamdi said, win, win, win. Win for the NGO, win for the government, uh, local government, local city, uh, local governments are in many, many cases, they act quicker, local governments, uh, city mayors, village mayors, they act quicker and they are much more focused and uh, results oriented than federal governments. So working with local governments, working with NGOs, providing solutions, and every community which housed these 5 million entrepreneur, women entrepreneurs became richer, better communities because women go out and hire more women workers and um, they spend the money that they earn on educating their communities and that community becomes better and richer as, as a result. Many other examples, the water neutrality project of Coca-Cola was exa exactly another golden triangle where Coca-Cola announced to become water neutral, i.e. I, I give back to the world another half a trillion liters, that it, 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 half a trillion liters of clean, drinking water that it used around the world. Again, NGOs, the World Wildlife Fund, and then local uh, governments in each country, and then the Coca-Cola company on the business side. So um, it really is uh, one where if you get the, the linkages right, if you talk sufficiently openly and you see that you can see a, 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 a clear road uh, as opposed to a donation road, a clear road to financial sustainability. The whole algebra becomes one which can sustain itself and what can provide the solutions. Uh, again, um, I not only thank our, our distinguished panelists today, but the, uh, all the panelists that will be part of this week that John Marie so ably and uh, which such great leadership put together. So um, I'm very excited um, to be here and thank, thanking all our panelists once again. Thank you very much, uh, Mutar, and thank you for bringing to life that powerful example, which has been an industry leader, inspired many corporations. Um, I'm delighted that we also have Matthew Devlin with us here in person. And, you know, when I first met Matthew, he was, um, you know, dealing with conflict, local conflict, I'd say, you know, Uber rolling out across America and also around the world. Um, uh, but, you know, in more recent times, uh, you, you know, you've really helped to create a global presence, including in very difficult settings. I know recently uh, in the Ukraine, 
uh, you've been partnering with the World Food Program, you announced, uh, and really doing, uh, and I think the story of Ukraine will come out this week in different examples and different panels, because there are things happening in real time there that are quite extraordinary. And among those, I think, are interventions by the private sector to step in where uh, public agencies are having difficulties uh, or not naturally go. Uh, so could you share with us, you needn't just speak of Ukraine, but uh, I think you've been in many settings now thinking about the power of what your company can bring to bear in, in difficult settings. Sure. And, and thank you again for having me. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. But uh, Uber, so we operate in 75 countries globally, uh, many of which experience conflict or the threat of conflict, or at the very least, uh, heightened insecurity and and instability. So that can be across Latin America, <laughs> the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central and, and South Asia. Um, but I do think uh, rather than try to add to some of the global frameworks uh, that the other panelists have offered, I can be pretty specific about what's happening in Ukraine and how, how we're acting there. Because uh, again, as Merit said, that's in real time and, and very much on the ground and, and concrete. Um, so if you go back to the 23rd of February, uh, we had operations in nine cities in Ukraine, about 35,000 people worked on our platform in the country. We had a very large joint venture in Russia and Belarus and other um, former Soviet republics with Yandex, uh, the Russian technology company. And we had hundreds of employees and contractors in Ukraine, in Belarus and Russia, uh, or and or their immediate family members in 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 those countries. Um, and we, of course, had large business also in uh, across the border from Ukraine in Poland, Slovakia, and Romania. So that was the day before the war began. And of course, the war began on February 24th. It's been 110 days, I believe, since then. Uh, and since then, we've been pretty much consumed by responding to, to the war. And to kind of impose a, a false sense of simplicity on what we've done, you can kind of think of what would doing in Ukraine and then what we're doing in the neighboring states to Ukraine. And so inside Ukraine, the first thing we did was simply keep operating, which may sound simple, but it's actually not the default feeling for most companies. Uh, in some ways, the, if you're risk averse and you're confused and you don't know that much about Ukraine and suddenly there's a war that everyone said wouldn't happen, maybe you should, should simply just stop operating because what can go wrong if you pull all the chips off the table? And we made a very different decision there um, that we would keep operating wherever possible and whenever possible through the war. Um, we made that for three main reasons, I would say. Firstly, um, you know, we were aware that we provide an essential service to our, our riders, uh, our consumers. Uh, public transport in many parts of Ukraine has simply shut down um, in no small part because a lot of simply a lot of the buses have been pulled over to Donbass to move soldiers and, and civilians and, and IDPs. And so the fact that we could provide a transportation option was had always been important and had quickly become essential. And so that was part of uh, what we believe was a part of the ethical obligation to keep operating where we could. Um, the other side of our platform are our drivers. Um, it's not lost on us that uh, continuing to earn an income remains important despite whatever war may be happening for people. There's the headline number of 13 million internally displaced and, and refugees. The other number you don't hear so often is, I think, 6 million unemployed in the first few weeks. And so continuing to stay active in the country, continuing to provide people a work opportunity was, was a big part of our decision to keep going. And then lastly, symbolism. We recognize that it's important. We have a, we have a globally visible book brand. Many people have heard of Uber. Uh, it was important that if we're able to operate there, um, other company, we could demonstrate to other companies that perhaps they can can take a second look and, and maybe they can keep operating as well. So once we made the decision to keep operating, it was a matter of where we could. Obviously, there's some cities like Kharkiv, um, Mariupol, clearly Kherson, either heavily shelled uh, and continue to be or have been occupied by, by Russian forces. And so we, we no longer operate there. But uh, in the rest of Ukraine, we continued operations. We actually expanded into more cities <coughs> in Ukraine again, driven by this belief that we are operating uh, uh, essential service for folks. And so when the war started, we were in nine cities, we're now in 16 at the moment. So actually the fastest growth of our business 
if you want to think of it this way, in Ukraine is actually been during this war, uh, which is a surprising thing to say. Um, then in cities, we obviously had to build in a lot of, of safety and security protocols in terms of what times people could take trips, which areas they could take trips uh, to, how would we respond in the event of a bombing or an airstrike. Um, and so there's an enormous amount of work went into that and very, very closely uh, coordinated with the local local city halls. I think Mukhtar just spoke to the importance of looking beyond the national government, and that's certainly been true for many of our experiences, but especially uh, this, this war in Ukraine, we work very, very closely at the, at the local level with, with those governments. Then what we're doing, um, we, frankly, we operate a loss in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, the revenue we make in Ukraine, we immediately turn around and give back to either the rider in the form of a reduced cost of transportation or the driver in the form of increased earnings. Um, and uh, we also give free transportation to the local city governments to move their essential workers and local NGOs to, to distribute supplies and again, move their own staff. Um, and that has simply, that's become our basic wartime operating model. Uh, we operate where we can and, and, and when we can. And as the situa situation changes, elements of that are in flux and probably will continue to be, but, but that is, we will try to hew as closely to that as possible through as long as this war continues. Um, in addition to simply kind of running a, a business like that, we're very focused on, on two, I'd say, core pillars of supporting Ukraine and inside of Ukraine. One would be refugee evacuation and, and, and transport for IDPs. So when the war first started and there was a big um, um, exodus towards the, the western borders of Ukraine, we basically threw open unlimited free, free rides on Uber. So anyone opening our app on their phone and in Western Ukraine could simply call a car to take them to, to the border um, for free. Over time, we've transitioned to a regular shuttle bus now that runs from the Polish border. Um, and people can just walk up and, and, and get on that, no questions asked, and, and, and we'll help get them where they need to be. Um, I would say another big thing, we've worked closely with international organizations. So UNHCR, we're providing their staff in Ukraine, uh, transportation to get around the country. Um, and we're also collecting and distributing essential supplies inside of Ukraine for IDPs. So well, Ukrainians are also really, really one of the main donors to Ukrainian IDPs at the moment, rather than uh, a lot of the aid coming from externally. This is internally sourced aid that just needs to be redistributed within, within Ukraine to, to IDPs still in the country. And so we're trying to play a small part in helping that. Additional to the refugee and IDP issue, there's, as, as Merit mentioned, kind of emergency food aid work. And so there we've partnered with the World Food Program. And their main challenge is uh, they can get large bulk cargo shipments into their warehouses in Ukraine, but it's the next last mile, which is a bit of a misnomer. It's the kind of last 30 to 40 kilometers, right? How do you get out from a central warehouse to end recipients? Uh, of this food aid. And so what we've done is we built them a custom software platform uh, that they can use to basically get, um, will dispatch a small car or a small truck to their warehouses, um, route the trip to wherever they need to go, coordinate with the recipient, um, confirm receipt, and then integrate it into their warehouse management system. And so we, you can think of it as a private label Uber for the World Food Program that um, that we built for them. And so we're going they have five main warehouses, uh, Lviv, Vinitsia, Chernivtsi, Kiev, and Dnipro. And so we'll be doing that last mile distribution of, of food from those central warehouses, again, out to those, those ultimate recipients. Uh, and it's something of a model now that we've, we've built the technology and kind of a fine tuning the operations of we can, we can also um, hopefully um, replicate that with some of the other large aid agencies who are having that that problem uh, once they get large shipments into the Ukraine, actually getting it to, to the people who need it. Then if you move across the border from outside of, to outside of Ukraine, a bit of a mirror image, um, you know, free trips, say if someone, we can bring someone to the border of, of Poland and Ukraine, we then are, we're offering free trips from the Polish border, um, which has become something of a choke point or was especially at the beginning of the, the war to the kind of, um, to the large cities uh, that are farther away from, from the border where most of the housing supply and social services are. 
And then once refugees arrive there, we're working very closely with a lot of the local NGOs and local city governments to again provide ongoing free transportation. Um, this is a refugee population, as many of you know far better than I, um, that is somewhat unusual. It's, it's uh, the, the gender skew is, I'm told, unprecedented perhaps. Um, it is predominantly uh, younger single mothers uh, with uh, uh, very young children, and then it is the elderly and disabled. And that's a function of Ukraine's martial law and restrictions on, on military um, eligible men leaving the country has created this, this, this unusual refugee population that has kind of lumpy needs, if you will. And so we're focused on trying to help uh, with that. Trying to, so it's pediatrician appointments, uh, counseling, uh, post-trauma counseling for children, and then, as you'd imagine, social services appointments, job interviews, language trainings, et cetera. Um, and the last part of what we're doing there is, which Hamdi, um, you know, very, very uh, modestly described as, as, as small and simple, but we're, we're one of his, uh, one of the companies in his, his definitely not small and definitely not simple initiatives who have tried uh, with his help and, and leadership to, to develop the muscle to, to build programs that find work and employment for refugees. So that's something we're trying to now replicate in, in Poland. Um, so how, we, how can we identify work opportunities for the refugees from Ukraine and also package that with skills training that provides them with some form of lifelong skill um, that will benefit them immediately in the short term and hopefully kind of enrich the human capital that is going to be turning, returning back into Ukraine, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, and so that's kind of just a scattershot of what we're doing. There's a long tail of other initiatives where we're either getting off the ground or attempting to get off the ground. But I hope that gives you a sense of the reality that um, to the extent we've done anything well and had an impact, it is only because we have done it in partnership with government or the social sector. And to the extent we've failed to work well in partnership with government and the social sector, I think the honest answer is we have, we have failed the people we were trying to serve to a degree. And so um, not that it needs re-emphasis in this room, uh, but the importance of what you all are discussing uh, is playing out in real time uh, all over the world, and I can certainly vouch for the fact that in, in, in Ukraine, and to the degree we collectively can become incrementally better at doing this work, I think over time, uh, these crises could, could hopefully, hopefully reach uh, exponentially better outcomes. So. Thank you very, very much. I think with that, we can open this up for some questions uh, from our uh, uh, very expert audience. Thank you, Matthew. That was a wonderful example of an intervention where you, you can make a difference, you are making a difference, and you have, you know, you're, you're choosing the instrument of your own business as the vehicle to, mm. to drive change. And finding those interventions where companies can be effective is, and then finding those coalitions uh, that can work uh, is part of the challenge that I think uh, Hamdi and Mutar uh, and Amira have all emphasized in, in, in different ways. Um, each one of our speakers uh, really deserves uh, this full session, but instead we are all together uh, without enough time for each, but a great richness of perspective has been offered. Let me invite, we have now a time for some questions and comments from our fellows. Sir, please introduce yourself and please um, ask your question, comment. Uh, my name is Alper Cesar. I'm from the Turkish mission uh, to the UN. And uh, I want to thank the panelists for their, their briefings, but very useful insights in their work also. Um, my question, or rather comment, relates to uh, the remarks by Mr. Hamdi Olukaya. Uh, he mentioned that, you know, if a business uh, makes profit uh, from from a conflict i wouldn't re really uh, see it as as a business uh, which i uh, of course see the reasoning behind that but uh, given the situation in ukraine and uh, i also commend your work uh, as, as you were uh, there uh, i was thinking about you know all, all, with the discussion regarding uh, arms in you know, uh, exports to Ukraine. Uh, and I, I was thinking that uh, I think I don't think uh, the Ukrainian armed forces would be uh, 
as uh, ca capable in defending their country if they didn't receive uh, arms from from the uh, from certain European uh, nations. And I know that uh, Germany is, for example, the fifth, uh, fifth uh, biggest uh, arms exporter in the world currently. Uh, so my thinking was that you know. Uh, sending arms into a nation is not necessarily a fueling uh, a conflict in that uh, country, but rather enabling uh, the defending forces to, uh, uh, you know, establish like a stalemate in, in terms of the military situation on the ground that will hopefully in the long term lead to the necessary uh, groundwork for, for negotiations for a long term, you know, ceasefire and, and, the, and the peace agreement to be uh, Made. So I, I would like to hear the comments or... Yeah, yeah thank uh, you. Thank I wonder if uh, if Amira Haq would care to comment. Were you able to hear the, the, the observation? Yes, uh, yes, I did. But I, I think it was addressed to Hamdi because of a comment that he made. Okay. Yeah. Well, the Turkish... Yes, Jenny, I'm more expert on Amira, but I, I, I agree with Alka. I mean, there is, there is, there is some benefit might come from supplying arms to defend someone is in need. But I think when it comes to conflict resolutions, um, I think for me is conflict resolution before the conflict starts, right? So uh, there was a lot of time with conflict before the war started. And I think we could have, we could have start, stopped it and before you know, we have all these instructions that we are seeing, uh, millions of people lost their homes and refugees, like Matthew has been explaining. Um, you know, the, 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 you look at a lot of um, damages on earth or war or, um, you know, deforestation, um, you know, you follow the chain, at least, you know, my limited knowledge on, as I growing up, is somehow someone getting rich out of that uh, somewhere where a lot of people are suffering. I'd like to think that the era of that kind of business is, is done, mm -hmm. where businesses align with you know, public benefits, uh, as it's good for business, it's good for, for, for greater um, you know, community. Uh, so you know, I'm not gonna sit here and defend uh, why arms are good for one and one another. I think where you want to go, and I think what uh, Muhtarabi had in mind is how we can move um, society forward that we don't need to use arms. You know, you can have that conversation to today's topic in this country where, you know, children are being shot and there is a opinion of second amendment, why people need to have an access to, to guns. And an extent to that, there is a lobby uh, and there is a gun manufacturing community. And, and you can argue in so many different directions of why this is, and that's endless. Um, you know, you can go forever for that one. But in the end, we don't want children to die, right? So how do we, how do we get there? How do we, how do we find a conflict so, you know, we, we, we use the uh, business policymakers and, and, and a civil servant, civil service, uh, uh, you know, to come together and say, okay, enough, enough, and we need to find a solution to this. Um, I want to add one more thing, what Matthew said, um, uh, you know, on, on Ukraine. I was at that border and I met with people, drove on, on Uber cars and crossed the border. And if it wasn't that Dara and the team had made a decision to continue to operate and use that resources to you know, mobilize people to cross the border so they can get into safety. Um, people life sa saved because of that decision. And you, know, you, you give another example there is, you know, we went to a, a place where there was a cash center where the Ukrainian refugees and, and just, just at least at one, one this topic, we can agree uh, the Europeans, the Polish, the Germans, Romanians, Slovakians, you know, the, the, the list goes on. 
they really come together really fast. They uh, activate a lot that they had before to have Ukrainian to access to work and public uh, services like education and schools. And the people come together and the businesses come together. And I think in, you know, we keep coming to this refugee topic since I raised in, in recent refugee developing, you know, refugee making conflicts, this one was the fastest people move ever. You're talking about within four or five weeks, um, three, four million people passed from that border. Uh, when in Syria, it took a few years. In Colombia, it took a few years, and some of them is more. But yet, you couldn't find one refugee on the street of anywhere in Poland or anywhere in Europe. You couldn't find one tent. There was no tent that people were living under. There was no, uh, you know, stadium or, or 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 you know, public arena where a lot of kids and young, uh, you know, young parents were, you know, living under rough conditions. It was organized so beautifully that, you know, as, as companies like Uber participated, people came to a border, they knew where to register, they knew which family was gonna take them in, they knew which city and town where that family was, and they were given a clear direction where to go. Now it doesn't take the problem away because they left their brothers or husband or loved ones in behind, but people, when they crossed the border, it was, it was welcomed by really beautiful humanity. And this, this model of getting together really worked in, in, in that scenario. Uh, and in, for example, in Poland, you had two and a half, three million refugees, mostly uh, kids and women and kids, like Matthew said and they were guests in people's home. So, you know, of course the people played the role, government played the role and the businesses played the role. And, and, and this is, is a showcase. And I hope that, you know, example, yeah. one example of this, you know, we've seen all around the world. But if you ask every single one of them, even though you see this kindness and you see this beautiful uh, welcoming, the best would have been that they wouldn't leave their home, right? That's, that's, where, that's where this goes to. And I. I come back to one example. I took a, a group of businesses with me to a country where there was 500,000 refugees had no access to work and the policy needed to change. And yet these people were working under rough conditions like human rights violations, child labor, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. If you take 10, 12, 15, 20 leaders of businesses and go to the policymakers and say, in order for me to extend my businesses, increase my product, production or invest in your country, uh, you really need to give a, a, a permission for these people to be a part of workforce. The reason for that is this is the economic study. This is why this is good for your country. And this is why we're going to hire these people. And this is what we believe because that's, uh, you know, um, that's the way that we are. The first reaction of the policymakers is why do you care? I mean, we never thought this would be a business, you know, to care about this. Uh, the second thing is that this is real. Uh, you know, we will come to your country, invest in your country more if you do this. And if you don't, I will have a different approach. Maybe some you might not like. I'd like to think that if business community get involved early on in this Russia-Ukraine conflict, and what would be the circumstances of businesses' reactions in Russia if they you know, if they continue on this aggression, maybe I'd like to think more now than ever before that they would have a second thought and maybe there was a way that they could solve this. My interest is not how we get together, which is beautiful, we should, and there are conditions that we must, but it's really, I think what Murtarabi is interested in is, is, the, is to solve the conflict because it be, be, before it becomes a destruction to, to a lot of people's life or, or, or community and society we live in. Thank you very much. I'm seeing lots of hands now and not much time. So uh, in that dilemma, what I'd like to do is to invite a few people to, to, to offer their questions and then let the panel respond uh, each uh, to that portion of the question if they wish. Let's start in the back, but we'll collect those comments if you could be brief and, and uh, we'll go around the room and then let our panel each speak. Thank you, and, and thank you so much to our panel. Um, I'm Caroline Quinn from the Permanent Mission of the United Kingdom to the UN. 
Um, my question is about whether there are more creative or innovative things that governments could be doing to de-risk um, business involvement in fragile and conflict-affected states. So Remy spoke about uh, you know, issuing bonds through development banks, but are there tax incentives or insurance underwriting, other things that the governments could be doing more of, but maybe haven't thought of? Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to this table, please. <coughs> Uh, my name is Ivana de la Puente, and the, I work for the UN Verification Mission in Colombia. My question goes more into what is your perception or recommendations also as business uh, men and women uh, in terms of what to do about the industry of, uh, for example, forestry, extractive industry that has a much bigger role uh, perceived particularly as um, those that are involved in conflict or start conflict and actually it's not really the fault of the business itself but it's also the lack of the government uh, providing leadership in terms of what can be done and not be done. Thank you to all of our panelists. My name is Christian Lubo. I'm a U.S. diplomat, diplomat for the United States and a SIPA alum. Uh, Hamdi very eloquently laid out the comparative advantages of government, business, and civil society in terms of how each has a role to play in, in conflict. And uh, the private sector, of course, moves quicker than government. And tech, even more specifically, I think tech has an ability to move very quickly. So my question is for Matthew. Uh, in the 75 countries in which Uber is now working in, how have what has been key and an important for Uber in terms of getting up to speed in those countries quickly and, and operating in those 75 countries, each with their own unique cultural and historical circumstances. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Tina Satoli. I'm from the EU delegation to the uh, UN here. Thank you to all the speakers. You've been really inspiring today. Um, I have plenty of questions for you all, but maybe I'll just limit myself to uh, a couple. Um, to Monsieur Rieu, just a question. You mentioned SMEs and um, and the, the the formal sector. Does the French administration have an approach towards the informal sector, which in many countries, I guess, is uh, very important in terms of uh, employment and social fabric? Um, and um, also, I uh, it occurred to me that maybe uh, what we need is a, a kind of shark tank for uh, development <coughs> kind of uh, concept in terms of um, the venture capital for social societal entrepreneurship kind of um, uh, vein. And uh, most of all, I wanted to ask the question, and uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Ken for, for bringing it up about incentives. And that brings me to my, my last question, which is um, maybe to both the, the, uh, the business representatives is um, beyond philanthropy and um, kind of having your heart in the right place, what drives your company and how do you make sure that those incentives are known by your uh, you know, counterparts and how do you make sure that uh, beyond doing the right thing, you get something out of it, out of, uh, out of uh, this, this partnership? Thank you. Okay, last two questions. Okay, we, we, we wanna give our panel a minute each, so please very quick, okay. I'll keep it short, Martin Vedas from the United Nations. If you could change one thing, for the better to improve the collaboration between the private sector and the, the public sector, what would that be? One thing you could do to improve that type of collaboration. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, thank you, Sayonara from Angola. Uh, I just want to thank you all because normal civil society is usually seen like uh, out of solution when it is regarding to the conflicts. And the example of Chobani company brings bring another perspective on integrating refugees. I would like to know if there is a, a specific country that you work with or how is the selection of these refugees and how things goes on and the procedure to have refugees in your company. Thank you. And the last comment in the back. Yeah, thank you to all for the very inspiring, uh, connecting the dots uh, presentations. Um, it is me at Majogri from the delegation dealing with human rights. So my first question would be uh, how you demonstrate that you are leading by example, because business and human rights is important for resilient societies and social rights. And uh, the second question is, 
you you just said that you are Uber is amazing what you're doing um, and and all the the rest as well. But I just wanted to say this is when you have a crisis. My question is early warning. Are you really involved in early warning analysis? So then you are there before the there is a conflict. So that's uh, and and the final one is: Are you planning to organize yourself globally? Because that will be interesting with lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's, of course, impossible to answer all these questions, especially since we are out of time. But I would like to give uh, each of our distinguished guests a minute to speak to that, which has been provoked by the questions we've heard. And uh, uh, if I may, and, uh, and then you can follow up uh, later as you see possible. Let me start with my colleague to the left, Remy. Um. No, thanks. Thanks to you all. I, I really um, appreciated the way uh, the discussion turned, mostly from uh, conflict resolution to, uh, I would say, working in uh, extreme economies, uh, which is the title of, a, of an excellent book you probably know by Richard Davis. Um, and looking at these very difficult uh, settings as uh, economic situations, I mean, where places where, of course, with extreme difficulties, you can uh, you can create value, um, is absolutely is absolutely crucial to provide, uh, I would say, short term and long term uh, solutions. So um, this was what we got uh, from so many um, interventions. Um, and it's uh, certainly a, a clear incentives to yes to, to transform our instruments. So yes, the risking uh, uh, is the way is the way forward. Uh, just want to insist on this that uh, uh, it starts with again with local actors. Uh, so we we maybe because we are in New York. We think that the solution will come from foreign interventions, be they uh, military or <laughs> in terms of uh, economy. Uh, I, I want to stress that uh, it starts with local actors. Uh, and so the, the risk uh, appetite, of course, of these, in, these actors, be they formal or uh, informal, are, are very different from what uh, foreign direct investors uh, are willing to take. I mean, the, the geopolitical risk, I mean, this is their risk, uh, the, the currency risk. If you provide financing in local currency, I mean, there's no currency risk. <laughs> so let, let's start with a, a, a risk framework that is consistent with uh, the territory we have to intervene and then, then find a way, of course, to again, to, to connect um, uh, other uh, in, in investors, um, venture capital for, yeah, sure. Last point is, um, of course, uh, we understand from the discussion that we need to find a so governance uh, where we uh, we are all together. So there are many ways to do it uh, in many countries, but uh, we have again to have all capacities uh, all the time, including before, during, and after the, the crisis, including this capacity to to invest. Uh, close to the population. Thank you very much. Uh, may I invite Amira Huck for a final comment? I'm afraid you're on uh, mute. Sorry, yeah. I was trying to think of one issue where I could sort of lump all the, uh, all the questions. And um, what, what comes to my mind is procurement that, uh, you know, everyone does, um, you know, procurement of, uh, you know, goods, services, everything else. If, uh, you know, for, from UK, I mean, I think that if aid programs, if other programs could do local procurement, we would do a lot for local uh, businesses. And, um, you know, so someone else asked, what was one thing that you can change? Uh, one thing that has to change then is procurement policy. Uh, because even, you know, I uh, lived in Afghanistan for many years and uh, there even all the bottled water for all the troops was being uh, imported into the country. And I think there is a great deal that can be done 
if just through these kinds of policies, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, that uh, promoting the local public sector, you know, giving jumpstart to the economy in the conflict ridden countries when, you know, peace has just come. And uh, there is one organization called Peace Dividend Trust. I think that's, the, you know, their, their uh, mandate is really to try and do that. But I think we need to look at how we can promote jobs and small and, uh, you know, businesses in these conflict resolution, you know, conflict, um, post-conflict countries. Thank you so much. May I invite Hamdi for a final comment? Um, thank you, Merit, and thank you for this, this, this discussions. I think, as I said in the, in the beginning, this is by far one of the most important uh, topic. It really is. Uh, if you're going to make any improvement on any, any issues that we're facing, here, here in, in home or anywhere around the world. Uh, this is how we can start to think that we could solve it, really get bringing uh, public-private partnership together. We do have work to do on, on business side and the governments and policy makers have some work to do on their side, how to, how to, how to engage with businesses uh, and, and NGOs and other, other uh, important uh, players. You know, it's not easy. <laughs> this, this whole thing happens in rooms. Um, there is some, you know, uh, three ideas we have about each other. You know, the government always looked at the businesses in an eye of profit makers, the only reason that they exist or the only reason they care about making profits. Um, the businesses have, you know, opinions of, 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 of you know, the governments and all, or the policy makers. Um, and it's not all true, you know, uh, the, 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 the companies have to learn how to be passionate and opinionated about some uh, topics and, and, and learn not to be political. Uh, so, you know, stay above and beyond the politics and stay connected to uh, the, the topics that you're facing. Um, and the governments needs to understand that businesses not just exist to make money, uh, they have greater responsibility to all stakeholders. And that includes, uh, you know, the people and, and the community, people that work for them and the consumers that they serve. And, you know, if you look at, you know, the NGO world and, you know, public servant world, you know, there is a deeper understanding needs to happen that it's not all about raising capital for them to survive or operate. They need to learn how to tag into the businesses that they already have services and, and way of doing some of the work that they needed so they can focus on the, uh, the, the humanitarian side of things. So there is some work needs to happen, but in every examples, if, if we can get together and stay firm about what we want to accomplish and the result is a lot faster uh, than anything that we do alone. So we can't do it alone. We have to create these coalitions uh, and, and I think the, the only way to start building this coalition is talk about how we can build it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're, we're down to our last seconds, but let me uh, give penultimate voice to my colleague here, Matthew, uh, and then the final word to Mutor, if I may. I'll try and do a lightning round. So uh, the diplomat from the UK asked what could governments do to de-risk, you know, uh, investment in, in, front, in, in un potentially unstable markets. I'll make a vote for um, the very simple commercial advocacy and regulatory modernization. It's near and dear to pretty much the entire tech se sector, but many, many other sectors as well. I remember trying to get a business off the ground in a country that has an independent sovereign country that has uh, some challenges and opening up the law, the book to see what law would govern our operations in the 21st century. And it began, you know, invoking her imperial majesty. You know, it's, it's, it's tough to, to run a tech company uh, it, when, the, when the law is like uh, 70 years old. Um, the US diplomat uh, mentioned, how do, you, how, do you, how do you get off the ground across 75 countries? Very hard to generalize. I'd want, say one thing is finding a champion, kind of a policy entrepreneur, I believe, is the, the jargon people throw wrong, around these days but without a single politically empowered champion, it's very hard to do things in many of these markets. I will say in some markets that look from the outside like the most challenging in the emerging frontier markets, they actually can, there's a close alignment between what companies can do and what governments need, youth, addressing youth unemployment, addressing sustainable urbanization, such that cities don't become, you know, loci of, of instability. There's actually 
there's a there's a productive conversation to have in an environment that otherwise may look more challenging at first glance. Uh, sorry for going right through these business incentives. Why why are businesses incentivized to to operate in environments like this? And you can very few businesses have a business model that that makes money in a war in an active war. So that's 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 pretty basic. But beyond that, I would say, of course, absent. Um, absent um, arms manufacturers, but um, I would say consumers really care. I think Hamdi stressed this has always been true to some degree. It's just becoming increasingly true. Consumers really care. Most companies are consumer facing, many companies are consumer facing, and those that aren't employees really care. And I think that's a point that is probably insufficiently understood by our partners outside of the private sector. If you can get a company's employees to care, you can get the company to care. That's an extremely powerful lever. Um, collaboration, what one thing would be change about collaboration? Uh, it's been said before, but start before the conflict begins. Um, most private companies have no idea which organizations, public or social sector, they should turn to until something goes wrong. Uh, they definitely don't know who's the right person within that organization. They have no idea how to navigate that organization. All the terminology is wrong. The organization is set up differently to anything they've ever encountered. People use words they've never heard. Uh, and you can't really afford that delay once you're already in a problem. So start early and make friends on a human level so you can have productive, quick conversations. Uh, there's one question about early warning and, and are we too late? So we, we did begin early warning for Ukraine very consciously um, quite, quite a long time before the war began. I wouldn't pat myself too strongly on the back. I think that's just a general lesson many companies learned the hard way in COVID. There's kind of a general crisis emergency response functionality that many companies didn't have before COVID and have actually a thin silver lining to that tragedy built over the past couple of years. Um, and I think between COVID and Ukraine, I think most companies have got the message. You, you need to be ahead of the problem before it's in your face. Um, and then there was a question about how we organize globally, which I'm sorry I didn't catch, but happy to address afterwards. Thank you, <clears throat> Mutar. I invite you to close us out with any reflections you have from this extraordinary conversation. Yeah, it, is, it was an extraordinary conversation. Thank you to all our distinguished panelists once again. You know, I would just um, leave the, everyone with, with these uh, thoughts. Um, you know, bringing the golden triangle together, and on, on, I stress on one side of the golden triangle when we talk about government, local government, local, 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 uh, really, really important because mayors, towns, uh, mayors of towns, mayors of villages, uh, cities act like CEOs. They they move fast, uh, and only then um, can we effectively create the right uh, global mechanisms um, that um, the right innovation models, the right linkages and incentives, um, the right funding mechanisms, uh, the right coalition of uh, ideas and interests, the right education and uh, apprentice models, the right balance between uh, profit and purpose. Uh, and that really, I think, is, is how I would, uh, uh, the thoughts that I would leave, uh, uh, in the closing thoughts that I would leave. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our amazing panelists. It's been a wonderful conversation. I hope you agree. <laughs>